everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here with Rob Morgan. Welcome Rob. Hello, how are you? I'm great. So it's very exciting to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Rob is a game writer, a narrative designer and voice director. He is currently developing stories and scripts for upcoming virtual reality titles across multiple genres. And today we're talking about virtual reality and regular listeners will know how excited I am about this. So Rob, you are, you know, highly anticipated on the show. Well, I hope I don't disappoint. Oh, well, you, you can't because we've never talked about this before. So, um, first of all, tell us just a little bit more about you and your writing background and how you got into gaming and VR. So, I studied literature at university and didn't really fully expect to get into games, partly because I didn't really know how that was possible. There wasn't really... There was such a thing as a person who wrote the stories for games at the time, but you know you could count the number of people who were professionals at that job on the fingers of one hand. Now there are a fair few more, but still it's quite a small niche within the industry. But of course the industry expanded hugely in the last few years. After I left uni, uh, I essentially I joined a little creative digital agency where we hustled for digital work, and I ended up doing all sorts of things. Like, you know, designing websites and running social net networks. So I was a social network consultant back when it seemed every company had to have one of those. And then we ended up doing some work for Sony PlayStation when they were developing an augmented reality book title. So this was a game which came with a physical cardboard book in the box. And you interacted with the game by using the book. The book had effectively barcode markers on which were detected by the PlayStation's camera. And so by turning the pages, the camera could see that you had turned the page, it could see where the book was, and it could animate effects onto the book. It was a project called Wonderbook. And I joined Sony as an editor and ended up writing uh, material for use in the early prototypes. And then the, the format ended up being uh, attracting the attention of J.K. Rowling. Uh, and so we developed a title called Wonderbook Book of Spells, where she, J.K. Rowling, wrote a load of original Harry Potter material, all new stuff. Um, and my job was to adapt that material in and write additional uh, material to go into this game, which you know made uh, the player the centre of the experience, and they were a wizard at Hogwarts, and they were learning how to cast spells by using their controller as a magic wand and interacting with their spell book. It was a great piece of technology. Uh, so I ended up going from editor to the game writer on that game. And then we did a sequel called Book of Potions, which was similar, but with lots of nice physical objects which would appear on the book uh, that you could kind of pour big mm -hmm. kind of cauldrons and, you know, mix chemicals. And it was, it was loads of fun. Uh, then I ended up uh, working on some virtual reality. So uh, PlayStation had been secretly working on a virtual reality headset, I wrote the dialogue for the demo which announced its existence to the world. And from that point on, I've been in virtual reality sort of primarily in the past year, mm -hmm. uh, writing projects for different hardware headsets, i.e. for different companies, but basically drawing on the fact that I've done some original storytelling work in virtual reality to you know, then develop it for other um, other headsets and other companies. Because the point being that relatively few people have done kind of original storytelling or really any kind of original work for virtual reality. Most things that you see currently are kind of what we call ports, i.e. they're games which have been released on a previous system and are just being adapted over into virtual reality as a proof of concept. But now we're in the period where people are developing brand new games. So the fact that I had VR experience, I've been able to translate in that into getting more VR experience, essentially. But, I mean, people ask me a lot when I do talks, how do you become a game writer? And unfortunately, the answer is always as complicated as the one I've just given, because there's no established career ladder, really. There aren't any courses that you can do yet specific mm -hmm. to being a game writer. Uh, so people who are game writers now have tended to kind of fall into it or muddle into it. Mm -hmm. um, it's improving now and I'm, I'm trying to help professionalize the process, but it's still, but I feel very lucky to have uh, the opportunity to um, 
be a game writer in the first place because I always, always loved games. I just didn't really know this existed. Yeah, so, wow, that's amazing. And there's loads of stuff for me to come well, back. It, it's always that long, unfortunately. <laughs> no, no, it's really super. But just taking a step back, um, so you mentioned augmented reality yes. there as something with a physical book and then also virtual reality. So I wonder if you could just kind of explain to people who may not have seen either of these things. And certainly um, I talked about VR at a speaking thing I was at and somebody put their hand up and said, what is VR? So we're still not at the point where people understand what these terms even mean so what, could you just kind of define them and, and give examples virtual reality it's the easier one to explain it's um it's a screen designed to completely obscure your normal vision and replace it with something new and virtual so the way this normally is seen is in the form of some kind of space helmet in the way that we've been seeing in fantasy since the 80s but Virtual reality largely takes the form of a screen or a pair of screens, which is the real breakthrough that uh, that have been has been developed in the last few years, which go over the eyes, which essentially occlude or block out whatever you would normally be seeing and replace it with pixels. And you know, you usually have sound as well in order to provide as immersive an experience as possible. And as a partner to lots of the virtual reality development that's happening now, people are working on other senses. There are people who work on haptics, which is you know a, a way of inducing the sensation of touch. So that's that's kind of a partner technology. The core of virtual reality is always the idea that if you put a screen close enough to our eyes, you can make us see something that's completely new and replaces the existing world with a virtual one. The difference between that and augmented reality is that Augmented reality is quite a slippery term, but generally what it means is that it's like a layer. Augmented reality is means that you are experiencing reality. You might be seeing normally or hearing normally the way that the, your environment around you actually is, but your experience of it is augmented in some way by digital technology. Mm -hmm. So the way that this is typically imagined is through something like Google Glass, which superimposes a, effectively a screen onto your vision, but transparently so that you could be walking down the street and you know people imagine it as being, instead of seeing street signs or instead of seeing adverts which are physically painted onto a wall, instead a piece of technology digitally projects it in a way that you can see, but someone else might be seeing something different. So for me, augmented reality could mean just as easily something that exists only in audio, for example or even just something on a smartphone's handset. When you want to talk about the idea of augmenting our reality or experiencing reality in a slightly different way to the other people around you, if you've ever walked down the street while following the map on your smartphone, you're already kind of augmenting your experience of the real world with additional digital information. The reason people are excited about augmented reality is that theoretically, further down the technological line in a few years' time, it may be ubiquitous part of our experience of reality. That's how people kind of imagine it. So in the same way that smartphones have become a ubiquitous part of the way we experience reality, people can imagine a future in which a merging of digital and reality can take place where the downside might be that it becomes difficult to tell what is and isn't real when you walk down the street because the advert that you see on the side of a car or on a building might be digitally projected by your system, or it might be um, really physically there. Mm -hmm. But the great advantage of that is that you can create merging digital and fictional, uh, merging kind of real and fictional elements. And that's what excites me as a writer, the idea that you might be able to create an adventure in your own neighborhood where there really are you know, monsters around the corner to befriend. Or, you know, you can make a scavenger hunt without actually having to have the physical object in the place. Hmm. Um, if you're familiar with geocaching, that's a, that's a similar idea. It's the idea of a scavenger hunt which doesn't have all the overheads of actually having to bury something because just finding the place is the, is the core of the experience. In the same way, you can imagine augmented reality allowing us to have really in-depth, compelling theatrical experiences because I my, my my the first writing I ever did was in theater that's why it's exciting to me you can have actors performing actions in 
what appears to be the real world. But the actors don't have to be there. You don't have to pay an actor to stand on a street corner and do his bit every half hour because instead people can just come along and see something that you digitally left as a digital fingerprint on that area of the world. That's what's exciting about augmented reality to me. However, the, the key thing to bear in mind is that people are talking about virtual reality a lot now because we're on the cusp of it being commercially viable. People are soon going to be able to buy headsets which really answer the promise of virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Augmented reality is a few more years further down the line because it involves smaller pixels, essentially. If you want to try to trick the eye into seeing something that it can't distinguish from a real world around it, that requires a level of technical sophistication that we're not quite at yet. Mm -hmm. So virtual reality is where it's at right now. Yeah, which is fascinating. And of course, you're, you're wearing glasses. I wear contact yes. lenses. And I mean, I see that, you know, obviously Google Glass, you know, you could be wearing Google Glasses and, you know, with the tiny little thing on. I'm mm. I'm interested in when we're going to get the contact lenses. Yes. Because, you know, I'm super into doing that because I already stick my finger in my eye every day. But can Absolutely. You, yeah, maybe you could give us an overview of the, the tech, um, you know, because I've mentioned Oculus Rift on the, yes. on the show. Um, you know, where are are we, you know, you've said we're about to hit the mainstream, but what's it, what's it look like right now? So essentially what happened a couple of years ago was that Oculus was a small company and it's one of those typical Silicon Valley dream startups where it's founded by one incredible genius um, called Palmer Lucky. He's kind of the bigger, yeah, that's, that's his name. And he's kind of the biggest celebrity in VR. Essentially, Oculus came out of nowhere with a prototype which suddenly got people talking about virtual reality in a way they hadn't in 10 years because, you know, there were a few rather abortive experiments in commercial virtual reality a few years ago, I mean, you know, in the 90s, in terms of there were a few people who might have bought it. But ultimately, these were things which in no way were able to trick you into feeling that the experience was, was real. The pixels were too large. When you put the thing on, it was too clunky. The virtual worlds that we were able to create a decade ago were just not sophisticated enough. Suddenly, Oculus represented the fact that a lot of technology had all come into maturity at roughly the same time. Lens technology, digital screen technology, and miniaturization, which allowed these helmets to be much more comfortable than they ever would have been before. And processing power to create virtual worlds which are covered in, well, they're, they're sort of populated by polygons which are covered in textures which are sophisticated enough that they look reasonably real. To the point that people were suddenly talking about Oculus as this thing that, yes, virtual reality is a thing now. It's real. It really can make you forget that you're not there. So Oculus was kind of the big player and everybody was waiting for whatever they did next. And then there were kind of a rash of announcements of other companies who were working on similar things. So there are a number of smaller companies who are working on various virtual reality um, projects. The biggest one post-Oculus was last year when Sony announced that they were producing something called the Morpheus, which is, to be honest, all these things look very similar. Um, it's another helmet which holds a screen in front of your eyes. And this was significant because Oculus had kind of come out of the DIY personal computer community and out of that aesthetic. And people were kind of, were really waiting to get very hardcore games, by which I mean sort of very in-depth simulations. People were looking forward to the kind of games on Oculus which would let them play very, very in-depth flight simulators, for example, or very in-depth combat simulators. The fact that Sony then produced something which was meant to be a much, much more domestic product. It's a much more commercial product. It's going to come in at a lower price point. The Morpheus is supposed to be the technology that will introduce virtual reality to the living room and to the family and to a family gaming and a family entertainment experience. By contrast, the Oculus at the time, everybody assumed it was going to be kind of a you know, gamer in his or her bedroom kind of experience. That all changed when Facebook acquired Oculus. And still we don't know quite what that means, but what it probably means is that, that, that again happened last year. Um, what it means is that the two major players at the time were probably both going to be 
branching out and making virtual reality something which wasn't just about throwing grenades and shooting guns at people. The most obvious implementation of the technology that occurred to most games players, because you see through somebody's eyes, there are lots of games that are already like that, and most of those games involve shooting people. Instead, it became clear that the companies involved were very excited about more in-depth stories, about doing things which are more entertainment-based, more social um, because the fact that Sony were involved meant that they weren't just going to be relying on hardcore game experiences. The fact that Facebook were involved meant that they were going to try to turn virtual reality into something that is, you know, socializable and something that's more entertaining for more people than just a kind of a niche game experience. Finally, the third big development was that Valve, through their Steam format, got involved to produce a headset, which is being made by HTC, the mobile phone company. And this was significant because Valve were once just a computer game production company. And then they basically became sort of the Amazon of video games by developing a digital distribution format, which is a program you install on your PC and you buy your video games through it. It's called Steam. You buy your video game and you download it, and Steam manages your whole experience and theoretically does all of the troubleshooting for you. It does all of the matchmaking. If you want to play it online, it'll find your friends for you. And it's been an enormously successful format, and it's made Valve a lot of money. And it's clearly you know, them deciding to become big business players in games rather than just creative game developers mm -hmm. is what led them to the idea of developing their own virtual reality headset. And they're doing interesting things with their technology. They're creating um, a system of small beacons they call lighthouses, which you sit around your living room and which essentially can track you as you move around which allows you to create not only a virtual simulation of a room that you're seeing in front of you, but it also allows the system to keep track of where you're standing in that virtual room and kind of shift it around you and intelligently shift the terrain so that you don't barge into your own coffee table. That's, that's the holiday. Yes, essentially. That's the dream. The thing is, with all of these virtual realities, everyone is striving to get towards the holodeck, which is what's exciting for me because... We didn't see a lot of people, you know, playing hardcore games or gaming simulations in the holodeck, partly because Star Trek didn't really want to show you, you know, a load of people Just playing Quake. People. <laughs> what they used the holodeck for was stories. They, they recreated the greats of literature. They played around with interesting characters and they had romances and they had soap operas. And that's what's exciting to me because right now, Initially, it seemed as though virtual reality might still be the preserve of gamers who wanted to have very specific kinds of experiences, combat experiences, simulation experiences. And now the technology is good enough. The companies that are interested in VR are branching out. Everybody's excited about VR, you know, film production companies. Everybody wants a piece of it. And to me, that says that there's really, really exciting projects coming up, which are more about the fiction than about the sensation of shooting someone or of being there. They're more about telling you a really compelling story which you're truly immersed in. And that's what's really exciting about VR and why I think we're going to see some really, really cool projects over the next few years. Mm. Right, well, well, we'll come back to writing for that, but I want to ask yes. you also about um, the education space, which I had read that Facebook mm. were interested in, the fact that education is being reinvented, people won't go to universities, they, they already do courses online, but in VR you can actually be there with a class um, so that so education would be one and then the social side I wonder about high fidelity and that kind of um, social experience mm. online so what do you think about the education and the social space uh, and not just the gaming so I think there's a lot of potential um, I think that socially speaking there are already implementations and apps effectively which allow you to watch a movie in a cool space. So one of the things that I really like about VR, particularly mobile VR, so there's another format which I haven't talked about because it's sort of, it's, it's bubbling along in the background. It's called the Gear VR and it's made by Samsung. And you use a phone with it. So it's very, very portable. It's an empty box which you strap to the front of your face and you put your phone in and the phone screen 
is what generates all of the graphics. So the thing has some lenses in, but mm. essentially inside this box, your phone screen splits itself in half and projects things straight into your eyes. So it's not very, it, it's not as graphically powerful, but it is very portable. What's exciting about that for me is that if you have it on a plane, you can watch a, a movie in IMAX, effectively, in, a, in IMAX scale, rather than on the tiny screen in the head back in front of you, because you, you put this mask on, and suddenly it can put you in an entirely new environment. Now, that gets even more exciting when you think, imagine if you could socially sit in this virtual cinema and look next to you and see somebody that you wanted to see the movie with, even if they're on the other side of the world. And they're, they're in virtual avatar form, and you can throw virtual popcorn at each other and make fun of the movie, and you, know, you can have a social experience. That's really cool. And I think you could easily imagine something similar happening with lectures, uh, with um, anything where presence is important. Now, the open question is there are lots and lots of occasions where presence is very important. But when it comes to education, I think that's only... That's not the whole story, really, because we can definitely imagine that we might feel happier watching a movie with friends if we can make our friends virtually present, then great, that's a bonus. And there's a definite use case for that. We can all see how that would be useful. When it comes to lectures, it may be that a more effective educational experience would not be one which focuses on virtually putting you there, and instead it focuses on clearly communicating the information as clearly as possible. So I think we need to be a little bit cautious in thinking that the answer to what does a virtual reality university look like is to recreate the buildings and the chairs and the rooms as clearly as possible. Because when you get right down to it, that is not part of the core functionality of a university. The point of a university is the information that floats around within it. It's not about creating the premises so at that level, I think virtual reality can, for example, show us a 3D model of the universe in a way that you can interact with, which would be incredibly helpful to students. Or it could give you a, a physical model floating in front of you, uh, an apparently physical model of a human heart or of the entire respiratory system or whatever it is. Educationally speaking, the the tools that virtual reality allow you to teach with could be really, really amazing. And particularly for kids, because if you imagine any experience which is going to put them in some virtual trenches of the First World War, or it's going to put people into, um, you know, onto a, a, a ship sailing to the New World, the, in terms of educational simulation, it's as, it's as broad as you can imagine, absolutely. But I think the key thing to, to keep in mind is that it's got to be about the information or about the experience rather than, and the experience that's actually important to the learning experience or the social experience. So you're not particularly bothered if you're in that virtual cinema with all of your mates. You're not particularly bothered what color the chairs are or how comfortable they are because you're not really sitting in that chair. Yeah. Whereas in terms of delivering great content, that is the kind of thing that, you know, teachers are already doing, and really, VR just gives them a bunch of new tools to do it. Hmm. Now, it's interesting, and, and I know when I heard you speak at the London Book Fair, you talked about the, uh, that you didn't like the idea of the, the virtual bookstore because of exactly this reason, and sure. it, um, whereas I'm, I kind of come from a different angle, which is, uh, firstly, most people don't, and you said, why recreate something that's already kind of perfect, as in go, you, you can go into a physical bookstore, and my kind of thinking is most people don't live near a physical bookstore, yes. so in terms of online shopping, and also things like uh, my vegetable shop right now is all done on a cell phone um, mm -hmm. and I would love to do my vegetable shopping in VR where I could you know find things that were more serendipitous in a browsing shopping experience that wasn't on my phone so where do you see the the shopping experience right. going with virtual reality and and in particular in terms of books uh, where would you see that and books as a the content of books not the physical necessarily sure. object I with VR it really, it, what it can do is give you the experience of being there. And that can be absolutely amazing in terms of, if you've never been to a perfect bookshop, 
you know, I mean, but I suppose we're quite spoiled in that. We're in I, London. <laughs> I know what the perfect book should look like, definitely. And it, there would definitely be a lot of value in someone recreating that as a virtual experience. I think, I know, for example, if you want to talk about a signing or a book launch, mm. that's something where telepresence through VR could be incredibly helpful because everybody could have a front row seat to a signing or a reading in the same way that everybody could have a front row seat to the opera via virtual reality. Um, now, in terms of like actual retail, it's not that I don't see the appeal of having this exhibit of the perfect bookshop. What I wonder is whether the shopping interface of virtual reality would be better and more useful than a two-dimensional shopping interface of the kind that we're familiar with on Amazon. Now, it, it's possible that this is a lack of imagination on my part, because I'm sure that someone is going to come up with an incredibly badass, like, you know, you, you, you swipe things around and you have virtual shelves in front of you and you can swipe through all of your vegetables. I'm sure that that is probably coming. It's just that, uh, similarly with a bookshop, you know, you you can swipe through things in order to, you know, see uh, the range of books available. And like you say, have an element of serendipity in shopping, which mm -hmm. Amazon and other online book retailers, like any other retailer, they try to sort of simulate serendipity by showing you things that are tangentially connected to what you're buying. So there is definitely a fun and very kind of intuitive shopping experience somewhere in there to do with having like a spatial metaphor and going back to spatial metaphors of shopping where you might scroll through shelves mm -hmm. rather than just clicking on links. But I don't think that's the same thing as recreating a bookshop with a high level of fidelity because you're talking about something which has a layer of abstraction. So the shelves aren't really shelves. The shelves are you know, uh, digital things that you can scroll through. So although I think there's definitely, there's a whole matrix of possibilities there. What I don't want to see is, <clears throat> particularly book companies, spending a lot of money on developing a really, really rich and realistic virtual bookshop and kind of thinking that that is the right use of virtual reality for them because I don't think that's the answer. And I don't want to see publishers or retailers spending money that they could be spending on books and authors, instead spending it on a very, very flashy shop front, yeah. which isn't actually that usable. Because if you think about it, a virtual simulation of reality is going to have all of reality's problems plus its own problems. And the thing about reality is that it doesn't have a particularly good interface. So you, in terms of finding the book that you want in a bookshop, the perfect bookshop is like a rickety, run-down bookshop where everything is all higgledy-piggledy. It's not a perfectly mathematically lined up, everything is in order bookshop. Even if it was a perfectly mathematically lined up, everything is in order bookshop, depending on the level of reality of your simulation, are you going to have to physically bend down to look at the books on lower shelves? And isn't that rather inconvenient? <laughs> When you compare it to buying books on Amazon, which removes as many kind of as many barriers between yourself and purchasing as possible, they're very good at what they do and they've designed a very, very effective shop front. I don't think that I think that there absolutely is going to be a revolution in the way that we sell things once people are very, very accustomed to the idea of wearing a virtual reality helmet. Mm -hmm. It's just that right now, I think we're several years away from the point where anybody is going to put a special hat on to sit in their living room to go and buy their books when they can do it on their phone. Yeah. So although I would love to see a, mu a virtual museum of the bookshop where you can visit the perfect bookshop, I'm not convinced that that is a particularly useful way of selling books. Mm. No, I, I agree. It's just, you know, when you when I think about these things, you know, I think about having book launches in the Paris catacombs Absolutely. and, you know, having... And I totally think that could happen. If you, yeah. if with your purchase of the book or with your purchase of a ticket, you get the free book, you get the ticket when you buy the book and you can be virtually present at the book launch mm. and see the person kind of... In or, or you and I would do a podcast interview somewhere really cool. Yeah, you know, absolutely. If, 
it wouldn't just be you know on Skype type of thing. So I, I do I see like just a different way of of doing all the stuff we already do. But yes. but let's um uh, just talk about sort of what do you see the role of writers? So we've got fiction and non-fiction authors who are listening to the show. Um, you know, if we fast forward sort of a couple of years, um, how will writers or like you are now, like you're the sort of cutting edge of this. What what will writers and creatives be doing for this VR space, or what should people be looking at you know preparing for so something because i work in games i those are going to be some of the first things we see coming out for virtual reality which are virtual reality specific so there are a bunch of things which are essentially existing content which you can experience through virtual reality so um you can watch a film on a larger screen than you could physically fit into your flat if you sit in virtual reality, you can watch the film. Similarly, um, I mean, I'm really excited about a book reading virtual reality format where, for example, it can you can put your virtual reality helmet on and it will display the page of the book for you and just float it above you or float it in front of you at the perfect reading distance so you don't have to physically hold the object. You can literally lie back and bask in the reading experience, and it might be able even be able to track your eye movement and shift the page up as you reach the bottom of the page. I think there's a perfect kind of truly immersive reading experience format that might be coming along. I would I would love the ability to sit on a beach wearing a, you know what's effectively a big pair of sunglasses, and then the book just kind of scrolls itself up at the perfect screen, speed in front of me. So there's a lot of Existing content that is being written or being developed in the way it always has been, which will see kind of almost a new kind of existence on virtual reality. In terms of writing things or creating things specifically for virtual reality, I think it's going to be a few years before we're out of the early adopter phase, the experimental phase. Right now, I think we're still working out the rules of having a, a good experience for virtual reality. So, I mean, and often I, I, I talk about these rules a lot and I talk to game companies about how to optimize their virtual reality experiences. So a writer now who is thinking about getting into virtual reality, I would want to talk to them about really often very simple things like, you know, bear in mind that your user is going to spend some time getting comfortable within the Thing. So don't launch straight into your experience, give them a bit of warm-up time. Now, in terms of getting excited about it, I honestly think non-fiction implementations are going to be the really exciting things that we see first outside of the gaming sphere. So I think the idea of having a model solar system that you can simply hand to a student mm -hmm. and they can explore to their heart's content and they can physically, uh, you know, through an, in a, an interface that feels physical, they can interact with this model solar system and they can simulate orbits or they can tweak things and watch things spin out of control. That's incredibly exciting. That's the experience that I've been waiting for since I had Encarta CD-ROM when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah. And actually I think that anyone who has access to high quality digital models of anything, particularly anything anatomical, anything scientific, anything biological, if they can put those into a virtual reality space, that is inherently interesting and it's incredibly potential. It has incredible educational potential. I think that's the kind of relatively small outlay project that we're going to see a lot of early on. And that's what we're going to see as the big kind of the, the big uh, benefit and the big value add that publishers and writers can bring right now is that they can expertly develop that kind of really, really exciting model or that kind of really exciting, interactive, explainable experience. Mm -hmm. In terms of fiction, it's a bit more complicated because it's going to continue being dominated by video games for a little while, not perhaps as long as the video game industry thinks it is. And of course, you know, the, there's a whole separate conversation to be had about writers who are... Uh, you know, fiction print writers right now, if they wanted to get into the games industry, that is 
that's a complicated and rather mysterious process. And I don't necessarily, like I said earlier, have particularly helpful advice to give on that front. I think if, if you're a writer and you're excited about VR, then what I'd say is definitely have a think about it and try out the headset and see if you're excited about it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Because it's not necessarily, it is totally exciting in terms of, oh, we might eventually be able to have this incredibly in-depth experience. It's just that we're not there yet. So um, try out the headset and, you know, you, um, we're not quite at the stage where you can simply go to a company and pitch them an idea for your virtual reality experience. But if you're a publisher, then there are definitely people who would be very excited to put out your educational experiences mm. in yeah, I mean, uh, I know we're... That's I'm afraid. No, no, what's so funny is, and I, I'm, you know, I've been doing this podcast since 2009, mm. and things change awfully quickly, don't they? So, um, you know, just, just putting you on the spot, given that I expect to be doing this for another six years, mm. when, when do you reckon we're going to have something like the holodeck, and when are we going to have cool contact lenses where I can have augmented reality? Like, if you were to pick years, you know... Two, are we talking two years? Are we talking five years? Like, to me, it seems more like a, a two-year to four-year kind of window right now. The um, the contact lenses one is actually easier, uh, and I think we'll probably we, there are people working literally on that technology, and I think we'll see something which is not completely implausible or uncomfortable and you know, can help you find the directions to the delicatessen while you're walking down the street because you're wearing digital lenses. Um, lenses, oh, I don't know, eight to ten years. That's not the same thing as it being a ubiquitous technology, but I think there will be some people with mm. with those and you won't be able to tell who they are. That would be me. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> the holodeck, like a true holodeck, Bear in mind that they don't wear anything when they... They don't wear a piece of technology when they go in. There's nothing mm -hmm. on their eyes. And kind of the, the holodeck simulates the same thing for different people, i.e. it's not like it's... It's not shooting light into your eyes, specifically. It's not targeting you. It's creating an object, or so it seems, a virtual object that you can swipe your hand through. But that's essentially trying to make light behave in a way that light doesn't really do. And, you know, we can create floating holograms in space, but the level of sophistication there, I'm less familiar with because that's really, that's getting into holograms, which mm. I know very little about, to be honest. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's but honestly, I reckon Polydeck we're far further away from. It's actually, strange as it seems, the idea of a screen that's small enough that it can sit on your eye is not that, unfeasible right now whereas an entire room which looks completely indistinguishable you can virtually make appear indistinguishable from another room without the user wearing anything in terms of technology or having anything on their eyes anything in their ears nothing that is that's a fair bit further away however we've no idea what might come along down the line so i you know, I'd optimistically put 2035 as a number on that. Ah, Why? there we go. Fantastic. <laughs> Within our lifetimes, I, I would yeah. not be at all surprised. Yeah, I must say, I you know, when I look at my great auntie who recently died at 96, I said to my husband, I reckon our old age is going to be a lot cooler. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> we'll have seen such an unbelievable amount of change, as I'm, mm. I'm sure your, your auntie did as well, but uh, just an astonishing amount of change, mm. to be honest. Trying to put a number on when any of these things might develop is is a thankless process because technology's advancement will always make a fool of all of us anyway. So, but what doesn't change? What I you know what makes me so hopeful about that you know the people listening and you and I, if you are a creator and you mm. create um, you know stories or information, you whatever the format is, whatever the technology is, you will always be needed and wanted. So absolutely. Content is absolutely king, and probably more so in virtual reality than anything, because what I say to games companies is virtual, virtual reality, the idea of putting somebody in a virtual experience, what gamers who are interested in VR talk about a lot is presence. 
And I, this is the idea that you feel like you're really there. And this is a whole unbelievable complex of different factors that our brains do automatically all the time when we're really sitting in a place. We have all sorts of little checks that we do just normally. Whereas if you put somebody in a virtual environment, immediately a lot of those things, no matter how real it looks, there are a lot of things still telling us that it's not real. Hmm. Which means that presence and immersion are actually kind of fragile. The idea of putting someone in a, in a virtual environment and wanting them to forget about the outside world and be completely immersed in the virtual world means you really can't slip up even once because the minute you see or feel something, you might even not be able to put a name to it. It's not like watching a cat stuck halfway through a wall or something. It could be as simple as talking to somebody and they don't make the kind of eye contact that you'd expect them to make when you're talking to them because they're a virtual construct. It's unbelievably complex and, uh, and expensive to make a virtual environment which can trick the human eye and ear because we're incredibly sophisticated at spotting fakeness. The human brain is really, really good at that. But that's why, for me, content is so important because it's so almost impractically expensive to create a virtual world which is so realistic that you forget that you're not really there that a far better answer is just to tell a sufficiently good story that the user is on your side and they don't want to remember that they're not there. Suspension of disbelief. They want to be there, and so the fact that it's not perfectly, perfectly real doesn't bother them quite so much because they're immersed. You can get an emotional immersion, which is much cheaper to do than a virtual visual immersion because that requires unbelievable amounts of mathematics and ongoing academic studies into exactly how the human eye behaves and exactly how our eye contact behaves while we're making conversation with people. There are plenty of things we don't understand, but we can spot when they're not real. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you just tell a really good story, everybody can get into that and can forget that they're not there. The thing is, people who work in print have been immersing people in in fictional worlds for thousands of years, using nothing more sophisticated than ink on the page. The fact that now we have all this technology which can create very plausible images right in front of the eye and trick us into thinking that we're there doesn't mean that we don't need to tell a story once we've got the player in that place. Actually, the story is even more important because if they don't have anything to emotionally engage with in the new virtual environment, they're going to lose interest in it really, really quickly. Because any virtual environment is always going to be slightly less interesting than reality. Mm. But stories are more interesting than reality. And that's why they're so powerful and why they're going to continue to be of enormous value, even in virtual reality, particularly, I think, in virtual reality. Fantastic. Well, this has been so interesting, Rob. So get, tell people where they can find you online. So I uh, um, I have a website at gamestory.co.uk, G-A-M-E-S-T-O-R-Y.co.uk. Uh, I'm on Twitter as at about this later, A-B-O-U-T-T-H-I-S-L-A-T-E-R. Um, and I, I'm a, a jobbing writer, so I'm always doing something, usually in games or now in um, interactive experiences and augmented reality. Hopefully, there's some projects coming up. Um, yeah, and I, I tweet about virtual reality quite a lot and kind of the, the way that that technology is developing. Unfortunately, because of the games industry, most of the things which I'm currently working on are things which I can't talk about. So I tend to announce, oh, this game that I finished working on six months ago is now coming out and now I can talk about it. Um, which is just, that's just the way games work. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where you can find me. Or I'm, I, I do a lot of talks, so I'm bound to come up sooner or later. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Rob. Not at all. Thank you. It's been fun.